annual representation of transversal matroids with applications in parameterized algorithms. And this is a joint work with Daniel, Pranavendu, Fahad, and Merav. So the outline of the talk will be, I'll give you some small introduction to matroids and representation. And then the main topic of the paper, transversal matroids and randomized representation. And then our new notion of union representation and what our results are, and finally conclude with some applications. So what are matroids? So I'm sure all of you know what matroids are. So it's basically, uh, you have a universe and it's a family of sets which satisfy certain properties. So, and what are the properties they satisfy is that if, first of all, an empty set is inside this family, and if some set is there, then all its subsets are present in the family. And the most important sets, most important condition is I3, which is that if you have two sets where one set is strictly larger than the other, then from the strictly larger set, you can add an element to the smaller set, and that set will still be in our family. And all these sets are called independence independent sets, and the rank of a matroid is the largest set, largest size independent set in my family. Now, matroids are well studied in math is a mathematical structure with lots of applications in computer science, and for example, they generalize the notion of linear independence in vector spaces, and like computing maximum or minimum weight independent sets or matroid intersection are quite generic algorithmic problems, and they can be used to model, say, for example, algorithms to compute minimum weight spanning tree or bipartite matching and things like that. Now, notice that the number of, like, you have a universe and you have a, your family of independent sets could be very huge. Now, a natural question is, how do we represent them? And so the question is, how do we represent them succinctly? So there are several ways to do that. Like, in case of uniform matroid, which is basically you have a, un you have a universe, and uh, independent sets are basically, you fix a number t, and you say all subsets of size at most t. Then in this case, all you have to give is a number n and t, and you can represent. And then you have examples like graphic matroid, which is nothing but universe, it's a given a graph g. You can define it as follows. You have universe as edge set, and your family is basically set of forests. Right? So graph itself can be used as a uh, representation. Similarly, you can define co-graphic, and we'll see transversal matroids and gammaids a little bit later. They can be also represented just by giving a graph. And uh, most important is, you know, uh, like you, you can take matrix, and you have a universe is nothing but a set of columns. Indices are your, your universe, and a subset is linearly independent or is an independent set if, the, if in the corresponding matrix they're linearly independent. And these are, these are called what is called linear matroid, and we'll see in a minute a little bit more detailed definition of linear matroid. So what are linear matroids? So you are given a matrix A over a, an arbitrary field F, and let E be the set of columns of A. And now given A, we define the matroid M as follows. So a set X is independent, if and only if you look at the corresponding columns, they are linearly independent over F. So these are called linear matroids. And this is why, in, so these are the first matroids which were probably discovered first, and that is why the name independent sets comes for the sets in this family I. And the matroids that can be defined with such a constructions are called linear matroids. And let me define linear matroids and representable matroids. So a matroid, EI is called representable over a, fine, over a field F. If for every element you can find a vector, F, L dimensional vector, with the following property. So, so you have E1 to EM. These are basically, so you have a vectors corresponding to each element in your universe. And a set here is independent if and only if they're independent as a columns in this matrix. So basically what it means that it gives you a, a simple oracle to check whether a particular set is independent or not. So if you have this matrix, you get a set, and you want to test whether it is independent or not, or in family, you just check with their, whether the corresponding sets of columns are linearly independent or not in your matrix. And a matroid for which we can find such a matrix is called representable or linear or rep over this particular field F. So, so there are, so I just, a short note that there are nonlinear matroids. So it's not that every for every matroid we can come up with such nice representation. So 
But all the matroids which we talked about, like graphic, co-graphic, transversal, gammoids, they all are representable. And some algorithmic techniques do require this representation. So most of the algorithms, like on metroid parity, metroid intersection, which we know of, they all use this kind of representation for, for its computation. And also in parameterized complexity, we use something called representative family, which is a base, which is a useful tool for lots of important applications. They also require the explicit representation of a given matroid. So I will not go there. So let me talk a little bit about transversal matroids and representation, which is the main topic of the paper. So what are transversal matroids? So you're given a bipartite graph u, v, with bipartition u and v. And your ground set is basically u. And a set x is called independent if and only if there's a matching saturating x. So this is how you can define a transversal matroid. Now, how do you give a representation for this? Bobby already told in the beginning, but here's a short Again, so you look at the adjacency matrix, a bipartite adjacency matrix for this. So call, your columns are represented by the entries in U. And basically, this is your, this is your bipartite adjacency matrix. Now what you do, you, ch you choose a large enough field, roughly a field of this size generally works. And you replace each element, each one, with a random element from F. And you can prove with non-zero probability that the constructed matrix is the linear representation of the transversal matroid. And you, all you need is Swarge, lemma, and union bound to prove that this is indeed a representation. And the question is, but this is a randomized polynomial time construction. And this is the only po known polynomial time construction of representation of transversal matroid. So what we want to do is to come up with representation of transversal metroid, which is deterministic. But unfortunately, we do not solve this problem. Okay. So, but we make a tiny step towards solving this, and this is what I'm going to tell you in next set of slides. So, so our main notion is a notion of union representation of a metroid. And what do you mean by union representation of a metroid? So union representation of a metroid is basically a collection of matrices. So now, we do not have one matrix, but we have collection of matrices matrices A1 to AT. And they, all these matrices have the columns are basically in bijective correspondence with the universe of your matroid. And the following property holds, is that if you have some set X which is independent in my family, then there is a matrix where this set of columns are linearly independent. But the other point is, you give me any set of columns in any matrix which is linearly independent, then the corresponding set is what do you call it? is in my family. So in some sense, in terms of as an oracle, if I give you a set X and you want to test whether this is, uh, this is a part of, this is linearly independent or not, all you need to do is go and check in every matrix whether this set of columns are linearly independent or not. The cool fact is every metroid has a union representation of size equal to this independent sets. Basically, you make one matrix for each independent set. So if the matrix, if the matroid is linear representable, then you have just one matrix, so t equal to one. But in general, you could have, even for non-linear matroids, you have an exponentially sized representation. And this is algorithmically useful when the matrices T is small. So all the known algorithms which I'm aware of for metroid intersection, metroid parity, you can, if you had a union representation for your matroids, you can run those algorithms just that you have to multiply with this number T in the running time of your algorithm. So this is algorithmically useful thing to have. And so here's my question which, for which I'm still trying to find some interesting answer. So as I told you, every metroid has union representation, but its size is equal to cardinality of i, linear or nonlinear. So basic question which I would be interested in, or one is interested in, that to characterizing nonlinear metroids that needs maybe constant number of such matrices, or maybe polynomial in the size of E, or maybe sub-exponential in size of E, or quasi-polynomial in size of E, I don't know. Be even if for those matroids, we can, if we can prove that it has polynomial in the size of universe, this union representation, then we will be able to use all the known algorithms in this setting. 
So this way we can generalize all the known algorithms for linear metroids to nonlinear metroids. And that was our main motivation. And what I'm going to do is to show, so as a fact of this, I'm going to show a result that for transversal metroid, we can actually come up with an union representation, though the number of matrices which we need is two to the power log square r, where r is the rank of the matrix, so it is like quasi-polynomial in the rank. And the runtime we need is still quasi-polynomial, and the bit length of each matrix entry is also quasi-polynomial. Okay? But I'm going to show you a slightly simpler version of this result. It's basically I'm going to replace all r by n, where n is the number of vertices in the graph. Okay? So I'm going to just give you the full proof to this in just four slides. So the proof overview is that, notice that if x is some subset in U which is linearly independent, then what did we say? We said that there's a some set, there's a, there's a matching which saturates this. It means we can find y in V, so the graph induced on x union y had a perfect matching. Because x and y, and there's a matching that saturates x. And we define this notion of uh, what we call isolating weight function. So this weight function is basically, we can think of them from, so this think of this n as one to n, which is basically you can think that the left-hand side of your bipartite graph are indexed with one to n. And this right-hand side is graph is again indexed from one to n. And this weight function is from one to n cross one to n to natural number. And so given a bipartite graph, I can think of like, I can think, that you know, uh, of uh, given uh, this weight function can be thought of a weight function in this bipartite graph by, you know, by giving some kind of bijection from a vertice in A to one to n and uh, injection from vertice in B to this, and we call this weight function is isolating. If G has a perfect matching, then G has a unique perfect matching with of minimum weight. The normal notion of isolated weight function. Okay, so once you have isolated weight function you can define a notion of isolating collection. So basically what is an isolating collection is just family of weight function from one to, one, one to n cross one to n to natural number, such that for any bipartite graph G, you have some weight function which isolates a perfect matching in this graph, right? So it is just a characteristic of n, it's not characteristic of bipartite graph, so it's independent of all bipartite graph. So given a number n, I can generate this set of weight function. Now, you give me a bipartite graph, there is a weight function in, in my, such that if you apply that weight function, then the, there is a perfect matching which has a unique minimum weight. So, and how do, from there do we get isolating weight function? So if you know, there has been recently a lot of developments in showing that bipartite matching is in quad G and C, so we looked through their paper, and from their, way, their paper, here's an interesting result which comes out, is that actually what they prove is that for every n, there is an isolating weight function of size two to the power log square n, and this can be obtained in this quasi-polynomial time, and every bit is of size order log square n. So once we have this set of weight function, we can do as follows. So this is how we define a matrix associated with weight function. So remember, when we were making this weight, uh, making this uh, transversal metroid representation, we looked at this adjacency matrix, bipartite adjacency matrix, and replaced each one with some big field element. Now we are not going to do that. What we are going to do is that we are going to replace that one with two to the power weight of that age given by this weight function. So that's all that this matrix is going to do is. So we, have, we take the same adjacency matrix, replace each one with two to the power, the weight given by this weight function. So what is our union representation? It's very simple. What we do is that we take A, and uh, for every weight, for every WN, which is an N isolating weight function, for each weight function, we create a W by replacing each edge with two to the power, the weight given by this edge, and that's it. And one can show that this is a valid T union representation for graphic, for representation. And the basic idea of the proof is very simple, that if W is isolating weight function and G contains a perfect matching, then determinant of this graph, determinant of this matrix is non-zero. Okay. okay, and this is, this follows from if you, 
from old results of Mulmule and Vajrani where this isolation lemma was introduced. So I'm not going to give you a proof for this, but once you have this, the proof is very simple. So you want to show that you have a set X in your matroid, which is independent, then you know there exists some Y such that graph induced on X union Y has a perfect matching of size at most N. It means there exists some weight function which isolates a perfect matching on this, which immediately implies that this gives us a matrix WG div where this is not equal to zero. It means this set of columns are linearly independent. And how do you show reverse? Reverse, if you have some set of columns which are linearly independent, it means, look, there is some subdeterminant which is non-zero, and if you, what do you call, unravel it over permutation, there is some permutation for which is non-zero, and if you go back, you will find a matching there because there cannot be zero there, and then you are done. So this just follows from the simple properties of determinants. So basically, that was a very simple proof, and this is the main idea which we use. So our main uh, idea was to use notion of T-union representation and use this nice tool which was developed in this paper, so quasi and C. So, so what we actually show is that our main theorem, which requires a little bit more hard work, is that not only this, suppose for the kind of application we need in parameterized com complexity, is that we are interested in not all independent, preserving all independent sets, but preserving independent set of some particular size. So for example, you're given a number R. So in time quasi-polynomial in this R, we will be able to produce set of matrices such that it will not preserve all independent sets of all size, but it will preserve independent sets of size at most R. That's, so it's like a kind of R truncation. So it preserves kind of R truncation of your linear matroids. And indeed, it also works in quasi-polynomial in the rank R. So this is our main theorem and uh, application. So we can use our application to speed up se several algorithms in parameterized algorithms, which I'm not going into details because of lack of time, but they do have an application. But what I would like to bring to your notice is some sort of conclusion and question. So what we gave is a deterministic computation of union representation of transversal matroid that is quasi-polynomial in the rank R. The most important question is, is there a deterministic polynomial time algorithm to compute or representation of transversal matroid, or a union representation with some constant number of matrices or polynomially many matrices? We don't know. Or even coming up with one matrix, but you are allowed to use quasi-polynomial time, we still don't know. And why we were interested in, because lots of algorithms, actually in parameterized complexity, use what is called gammoids which has nothing but dual of transversal matroids. So uh, one way of looking at gammoids is basically, you can think of a graph and you have two vertex set S and T, and you say that a subset in T is independent if there is a vertex rejoint path starting from S reaching to this subset. So this is like, this is a matroid which is kind of like a, which is basically for the paths. And they are dual, so uh, we are able to get because of union representation of transversal matroid, using duality, you can get an union representation of gammoid, but they are quasi-polynomial in N, because it is N minus the rank, but they are not quasi-polynomial in the rank. So if would, they would have been quasi-polynomial in the rank, that would have a lot much more useful properties in parameterized complexity, but we do not know how to do. So another question is, is there a union representation of gammoids that is quasi-polynomial in the rank? And my main question is, again, are there non-linear matroids that have T-union representation for small constant T? Thank you. <laughs>